Okay, so next up, uh, I'd like to introduce a, a close colleague of mine in the global uh, CCM team and legend of the information management sector, uh, Brian McDonald, who is going to be uh, giving us a presentation on sitemapping.guide, which is an online guide for the production of sitemaps, something very useful for all CCM practitioners around the world. Brian, please go ahead. Thanks, Bruce, for the intro. I feel like I need the entrance mute. <laughs> um, bear with me one second, and I will put up the slides. Uh, can you see the slides okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I think the last session on fire risk is a really nice segue into uh, this topic. Um, yeah, as Bruce mentioned, I'm Brian McDonald, Information Management Officer with the Global Team. Uh, and I'm here today to uh, present uh, IOM's work on the site, man uh, site mapping guide, uh, a guide for making site maps in humanitarian response. Um, I'd like us to, to all um, pause for a minute and think about the following six scenarios. Uh, a lot of them might be familiar to you from, from the various places you're uh, joining us from. Imagine you're in um, responding to a cyclone as a camp manager or a cluster coordinator in a city where a number of different sites have sprung up. And you're in a meeting where a wide, wide range of uh, service providers are discussing what sites they're planning to provide services in and, and which services they're, they're planning to provide. Second scenario. Oh, I should go through the slides. Uh, the second one is you're working in a conflict context and you're advocating for the perimeter of a particular site to be extended to help decongest that site. So you're engaging at the cluster level, with the, the local authority level, with the, the government level. Uh, the third one is uh, you're working in a large site and you're looking to understand what, uh, what paths and routes and, and services they are in that site to better understand, uh, uh, understand how to improve access and protection for uh, vulnerable groups in that location. The fourth one is kind of linked to the previous presentation, you're worried about the upcoming dry season and you're looking to examine which of the sites that you man your organization manages, which one of them has a high, which ones of them have the highest fire risk in order to prioritize where you're doing your activities, fire risk activities. The fifth one, uh, you're trying to figure out what barriers exist for IDPs in a site that's embedded within a, a wider urban area and uh, the, the barriers to the access for the IDPs in this location. The sixth and the final one is you want to know which part of a, a, a new site is at the highest risk of flooding or landslides for the upcoming rainy season. So you can start planning for potential relocations or, or possible mitigation measures. So kind of reflecting on those six scenarios, what do uh, they all have in common? Um, well, there's probably a lot of uh, many different commonalities between them, and I'm sure many of them will be familiar to the, the CCM folks we have on the call. Um, but for me, one of the biggest links between these six scenarios is the spatial dimension of uh, the understanding of, of those scenarios. So for the first one, you're sitting with people who are wondering where in the, the site the, the child-friendly space is going, where the temporary learning center is going, where should the distributions uh, be made? What space do we have in these sites and, and how should that um, space be allocated to, to different services in the camp? The second one, the spatial dimension of being able to quantify the, the space available and um, how the extension of the site may help to, to meet the required standards uh, around uh, the uses of, of space. Um, the third one, uh, how you understand how and where people move through your site and how the movements through the site can differ between different uh, profiles of, of people living there. The fourth one has a spatial dimension of being able to see and quantify some of the fire risk factors, uh, such as how close the, um, the shelters uh, are together in different sites. So you can start to understand the different elements of fire risk 
in the different sites and understand which ones are at higher risk. Um, the, the fifth one is uh, understanding where your site fits into the wider fabric of, of the neighborhood and the society and the uh, amenities that are available in that area. And can the um, IDPs reach them? The sixth one is about modeling potential risks. Um, so better understanding uh, potential impacts to, to the sites that you work in. Um, so one tool that has been very powerful over the years for addressing some of these um, problems are, are site maps. Um, so I just took four examples here. You've some really good examples from, from REACH uh, in Iraq, um, showing uh, some of the IDP camps there. Uh, you've, of course, examples from uh, the DTM and uh, IOM in uh, Kutubalong. Um, you've uh, cluster examples from uh, Bentu in South Sudan, and you have um, from uh, Mozambique uh, following Cyclone Day, you've the example of, uh, I think, um, a, a cluster uh, um, produced sitemap. So what we've, sorry, one second. I think we've really only started to scratch the surface of how tools like these can be really improving the evidence base for how we do much of our CCM work. Um, I'm about to show you in the next slide is the, the site, um, site mapping guide. And our objectives by producing this guide are, are four, uh, four main points. We want to be able to produce these maps quicker, these site maps. We want, when you're at a table discussing with different partners where to allocate the space in, uh, in an event like Cyclone Day, we want the maps to be bare with you in the conversation rather than having to wait, wait a week later for them to be published on a, on a website um, somewhere. So that timeliness is something that we really want to improve with, with site maps. Uh, the second one is um, to create them for more uh, sites in context and create them, make them available across more contexts in general. Um, at the moment, a lot of these site maps just get created in the higher funded context. Um, they only get done for the, um, the kind of highest priority sites. But what we want to do is, is make them, make it more of an assumption for anyone working in any of these sites that they will have a site map uh, available at a timely um, uh, for their site. And the third kind of objective with this uh, site mapping guide is to, to lower the barrier to the development of them. Um, quite often we rely on um, specialist profiles um, and specialist agencies to, to be able to produce these products. And I think by creating a guidance that's uh, clear and simple, we can kind of uh, mainstream uh, some of the skills around uh, creating of these. So, in, in, increase the kind of prevalence of the, the development of them. Um, and, and last but kind of not least, we want to make sure that there is um, a cons consistency to these sitemaps in terms of how they look and the, the quality of, of the work in them. So for any actor, be them a CCM actor or from any other sector who's working in a site, that they, they can familiarize themselves with the product quickly and, and use it quickly. Uh, and be able to assume that they have a reasonable assumption of the, the quality of that uh, document. Um, so here we I'll move to screen. Um, so here we have the the site map uh, site mapping guide. It's available. If you sorry, I'm going to move the thing. Um, if you go on to site mapping guide, uh, site mapping dot guide, or if you uh, click on, if you take a picture of the QR code, it'll bring you straight through the, the portal. Um, so th this is a, it's a kind of a, a living guidance. We intend to update it uh, over the next while, and it's available for download either as a PDF uh, or as an EPUB, e EPUB. So if you want to read it on your, your Kindle uh, in the evening. Um, we'll be uh, updating it quite a lot over the next while, but I just want to quickly go through uh, some of the sections in it. Um, part, 
I'll, I'll show the actual website rather than the slide. Bear with me one second. Uh, can you see the website still? Yeah, it's fine, Brian. All right, cool. Um, so it comes in three parts. Um, the, the overall workflow for the guidance is trying to um, understand site maps from uh, two different main modalities. So the first one being if you um, if your context requires uh, satellite imagery to create site maps. Um, so in a lot of places we work in, obviously the flying of drones is not a possibility, or it's um, maybe you need um, your site maps in a very quick kind of turnaround period. So one of the workflows is how to um, how to do a, a create site maps with satellite satellite imagery. The second one is about if you need to fly um, uh, drones for, for whatever reason to, to get the imagery and other uh, ancillary data. Um, so part one is about identifying the requirements. So before we dive into buying drones or um, emailing to get uh, satellite imagery, we need to like figure out our, our requirements. So we need to figure out our time requirements, the cost implications of the, the exercise, what skills and what materials do we do we need? Um, second part, uh, and uh, and of course the the regulatory and oh, sorry. Then the second part is deciding on what the, the the most suitable approach for your scenario. So obviously we need to very much look at the regulatory environment, um, the kind of protection environment as well as the security. Again, conflict situations. It's it's almost uh, never a good idea to be flying drones. Um, we need to talk to the, the community in these sites as well to make sure if there is acceptance of not of flying these drones. Um, so kind of part one, the section one and two are very much about uh, the planning phase of what's the best approach and what are your needs. So part two uh, goes into, sorry, oh yeah. So we have um, a checklist um, to, to quickly go through uh, your, make your decision. And then um, in part two, if you decide to go down the satellite imagery route, it kind of goes through all the different types of um, imagery uh, sources, um, the assumptions on how, uh, what resolution you need and, and details like that. And um, for IOM staff, uh, a detail on how to um, how to obtain uh, satellite imagery within IOM. Um, if your situation uh, requires that you need uh, drone imagery, uh, similarly, um, it, it go, steps you through uh, what do you need to get the kit, what type of kit you need, um, how to plan for flying the drone. Uh, stakeholder engagement, make sure you're flying in appropriate weather conditions, um, yeah, making sure you have the flight plan. So then it goes through some of the technicalities of when you're flying a drone, um, what angle you need to be taking the imagery at, uh, how to um, overlap the imagery the, to get the best match, and what height you need to fly the drone at to make sure that you're uh, not creating a privacy risk, but also getting imagery at a sufficient uh, resolution to make it useful. Part three then goes into taking that imagery and producing uh, maps from it. So in a lot of cases, you will be wanting to do a tracing of the shelters and kind of labeling of the different amenities in a site. Um, and Quite often, that will need a mixture of um, both the, the spatial map itself, but uh, engagement with the site itself to know which facilities are used, used for, for what services. Um, after that, uh, it's the um, creation of the uh, site maps itself. So we provide a kind of step-by-step -step guide and to how to do it with some uh, software, and we have uh, some examples as well, some templates that you can easily uh, load up uh, and use. And we kind of detail the, the different aspects that are important to include in any site map that gets created. Uh, the last section then briefly talks about the collaborative nature, and I think this is a, 
a key point. These these maps can be created for the entire life cycle of a site. You know, be it from like a plan to from a site planning perspective, or um, you know, in Mozambique, for instance, uh, extensions to a existing uh, collective centers. So they can be from that planning stage all through the kind of camp management and even the kind of closure phase. And what's really important and sometimes gets overlooked is these, um, the kind of knowledge management around these maps. So there needs to be a kind of collective collaborative feedback loop on making sure that the, the product is, is useful for you know, your camp managers, your site planners, et cetera but also making sure that um, the, the data and the, the map data itself is stored. So um, a year or two years later, we can maintain a kind of understanding and, and develop the, the products throughout the entire camp uh, life cycle. I think that's where the, the cluster can kind of uh, play a role in um, kind of providing some knowledge management around these products. Um, so we'll, before we move on to the, the kind of my last slide on it, um, have a think about some questions you have and feel free to pop them in the chat or, or stick up your hand. Um, what we plan in the future for the site uh, mapping guide, we still have some feedback. Thank you everyone to, who has provided feedback on the, the tool so far. Uh, we still have to incorporate some of that. Uh, you'll see it uh, appearing in the next few weeks. Um, if any of you have feedback on the tool, we'll be more than happy to, to take it on board and improve it as well. I think you'll probably notice from the guide itself, it very much focuses on the development of maps. Um, we kind of, we've done that on purpose. We want to do it in a bit of a staged approach. So first step is making sure you've uh, timely um, quality maps that are available for as many sites as possible. The next stage, we want to kind of um, look a little bit more on the, the usage of these maps for various tasks. Uh, so we've given some examples like on fire risk, on coordination in sites. There's many other things we could incorporate these site maps into, um, such as uh, dis disability inclusion, um, understanding how like gradient in site and the, the kind of topography of a site can, can play into that access uh, to services element. Um, safety audits is another area, fire risk. Um, so I think in the future, we'll look at adding on these um, usage cases of site maps and, and grow, expand the guidance a little bit more. Uh, you might be wondering why there is a picture of a snail, a frog, and a, a turtle or a tortoise on the, the screen. Um, one of the things that we were exploring in the creation of site maps was uh, the use of AI or automated tools to, to speed up the turnaround of creation, creating these sitemaps. One of the most kind of time and labor intensive tasks is um, in the creation of sitemaps is tracing out the individual shelters. Um, obviously, if you are in a place like Kutabalong, uh, that's going to be a very slow and, and painful process. And we've been looking at uh, different tools that kind of uh, automate or semi-automate that uh, tracing of, of buildings um, technique. Um, we've explored a couple of options and we haven't found one yet that kind of meets the sweet spot of being uh, cheap or free and easy to use. Um, but in the last couple of weeks, um, I don't know if you've seen on the news that it was Facebook have released this tool called Segment Anything. Um, and we're seeing a lot of use cases of people segmenting images of animals and pictures and things. Um, but there's been a lot of really interesting examples of the use of this tool for um, segmenting uh, spatial imagery. I think um, we'll explore a little bit more about how this tool could uh, maybe be incorporated into the guidance for quickly tracing um, shelters rather than to have to do the, the process manually. Um, I'll leave it there, um, but let's open the floor to, to questions or comments or any type of feedback. Thanks a lot, Brian. That was, that was super interesting. Um, I think, I mean, just speaking as a, as a sort of camp manager, uh, I remember 
uh, when I was working in Iraq in, in 2017, um, and we didn't have any site planning capacity, I was I was drawing site plans for extensions of camps using MS Paint before they before they um, uh, uh, discontinued that software. So this is super interesting. Uh, I think I don't know um, how others feel, but I think it would be very nice to see a sort of practical demonstration of creating a sitemap um, using the software, especially just sort of using, I guess, the, the easiest path, which would be um, getting the satellite imagery and then using some of the automation software to do the tracing um, to sort of pop out um, a quick sitemap. I don't know if there's something, thanks Juan. I don't think if there's a, if you um, would be willing to sort of host the practical demonstration at some point over the next few months for people to sign up, I think that would be a, a really good way of walking people through the step-by-step -step, um, of this of this guide. Um, apart from that, uh, I don't see many other comments or questions in the chat. But feel free to um, uh, pop in any further links um, to site planning to the site planet site mapping guide. Um, thanks a lot, Brian. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I'm happy to do a demo on it. Um, I forgot to mention um, for IOM staff, we have a deployable kit here to coincide with the um, site mapping guide. So that has drone, um, tablets, uh, a laptop with all the, the software ready to go. Um, so that's available for you know sudden onset, but also um, protracted uh, emergencies where, where that need occurs. And yeah, happy to support for uh, for its rollout. I think actually one of the drones is, is currently in Burundi for some HLP work at the moment. Um, but yeah, happy to do, um, to to work on a demo and yeah, perhaps um, integrate it as a practical session in some of the um, information management training as well. And yeah, just one last point on uh, MS Paint. Don't underestimate how good and quick uh, MS Paint can be at uh, doing quick uh, site plans. Um, yeah, don't, uh, these these ways with um, like GIS and stuff, they um, it can take a long time, can take uh, need skills. So a lot of the time for for um, site maps, you want something quick and easy and dirty. And yeah, a screenshot of uh, Google Earth and MS Paint can, is don't underestimate. It. Thanks. Picture of a napkin that you drew a site plan on. No, absolutely, it served the, it served the purpose. Uh, thanks a lot, Brian. Just out of curiosity, if you're gonna request a um, a satellite image from UNO, UNOSAT, how long how long is the turnaround time? Um, it really depends the resolution that's needed. Um, actually, if anyone wants to experiment with a really interesting tool, I'll share a link to it in the chat. It's called, uh, SkyFi. You can actually order satellite imagery on your phone. Um, it's quite nice. Um, yeah, from UNOSAT, um, usually that goes through partner agencies. So it'd be through uh, usually UN agencies or anyone who requests the imagery. Um, I think there's, yeah, from the IOM side, we have some service agreements with, uh, I think, Maxa and a few other providers. Um, so yeah, sorry, I can't really add to that question very well. No problem. Uh, thanks, Brian. I think there's a question in the chat. Um, if you want to respond from Paul about how we can how we can integrate other systems uh, into sitemaps. Um, but otherwise, thanks a lot, Brian. That was really interesting. Thank you. Oh yeah, I just yeah integrating other stuff. Yeah. So something we might want to look at is so. In addition to the map itself, um, there's a lot of other um, additional information, uh, like the uh, elevation model of the site for gradient. Um, I see someone mentioned lidar in the chat. Um, so what lidar? So what we when we think about satellite imagery, we usually think of these uh, pictures where you can kind of make out uh, like you hold a camera above the the site. Um, LIDAR is um, a radar uh, that can uh, give you a really good understanding of the topography of the site. So if you're doing like drainage work or, or anything like that, um, LIDAR would be the way to go. Um, it's also, uh, it's, current, it's pretty expensive at the moment. Um, so it's, unless you've probably $50,000, LIDAR is kind of out of reach for most of us at the moment. 
Um, but for instance, the, the drones we got are, are actually very affordable now. It's like 300 euro uh, is all it costs. Um, yeah, I think I can answer any other questions. I can answer them in the chat. That was great. Thanks a lot, Brian. Um, okay, so thank you very much um, to the three presenters from this middle section uh, of the day on a, on sort of climate risk mobility, um, fire response in Cox Bazaar, and the, the presentation from Brian just now um, on site mapping.